guys, welcome back to Revive School. How refreshing is it that we are in the Gospel of Matthew? Now, quick recap, let's just see if uh, Kevin is paying attention today. Kevin, who wrote the book of Matthew? Uh, guy named Matthew. Yep, Taylor, what was his, Matthew's other name? Simon. <laughs> this is so awesome. Levi. Levi. Yeah, yep. close. It's good. All right, so you have Matthew, also known as Levi. Uh, Rich, do you remember what Levi's occupation was? Yeah. He sold jeans. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, he was a tax collector. He was a tax collector. So this is his perspective. This is his background. So what he brings to the table, he's going to paint a picture. And I think this is kind of interesting because he's a tax collector. He's painting more of an authoritative picture of Jesus. Think about this. He's painting a picture of as a king. That's his mindset. When we get into Mark, you're going to have a different perspective from John Mark on Jesus being a servant. Are you going to get into Luke as the son of man? Are you going to get into John, the son of God? But right now in the Gospel of Matthew, remember, we're going to emphasize Jesus being a king. Now, we're in Matthew 17, and as you get into, get into Matthew 17, it, it's really one word as a definition for the whole chapter, and it's transfiguration. Now, transfiguration, I, I've... <laughs> We've asked our gentleman to come up with some different, uh, different uh, de definitions, okay? Now, Taylor, I'm going to take a deep breath here. When you hear transfiguration, what do you think of? Being transformed. Oh, that's like the polite version of Taylor. Being transformed. Rich, you want to add to this? Uh, it's a complete change of form or appearance into a more beautiful or spiritual state. Wow, you totally read that from somebody. Totally, it's right here. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> so uh, uh, can I keep adding to this? It's a metaphor, metamorphosis, okay, to transform or change in form. Jesus is going to do that with three of his best buddies. He's going to show up on a mountain and he is going to literally change in front of their eyes. And they're going to walk through, why did he do this? Now, one of the reasons is, is that I think Stanley Toussaint, one of my favorite professors at Dallas Seminary, he had a definition. He just said, it's the confirmation of the reality of a future kingdom. OK, so what he's saying is I'm going to confirm the reality of a future kingdom. And what he does is by, by showing the reality, he shows himself uh, in the future. I know that sounds weird, but he shows himself about what he's going to be like after the process of the death, burial, and resurrection. So he's going to be changed and transformed right before their eyes. And why not do it with your three best friends? So it says, after six days, we're in Matthew 17, verse 1. It says, Jesus took, and I think this is so cool, Peter, James, and his brother, John. Okay, so you got James and John who are, what are what's a, another nickname for them, Kevin? Sons of Thunder. Sons of Thunder. You wonder sometimes, though, what happened to Andrew? He's a brother. He kind of got left out. It was always Simon, Peter, and Andrew, and then James and John. And I'd be like, hey, guys. <laughs> guys. <laughs> and so what you have is you got his three best buddies. Now, he, I don't know why I want to do this, but you have this. Okay, this represents the three. Okay, then what do you have outside of the three? If you make a bigger circle, 12, the 12, right? So Jesus has his inner circle. Then he has the 12 disciples. And then really he has the what, Kevin? 500. Oh my plus. Kevin. He went to 500. I was say 72. Wouldn't that be nine, not 12? <laughs> no, you just go with it for crying out loud. This is going to be an interesting day. I can tell. All right. 70 or 72, right? And then, oh, Kevin, I can't believe you went to 500 already. <laughs> then you go to the 120 and then the five, Kevin, where do you get the 500? He appeared the 500. People the eyewitnesses, asked. that's right. So I'm giving you Been the benefit the of the So there is your 500. So Kevin, way to go. It's the classic centurion, 100 or 144. Irrelevant at this time. So here's the deal. After six days, Peter, James, and John, three guys, the inner circle were led up on a high mountain by themselves, right? Okay, so they're going up there with Jesus. In my mind, everything happens at a mountain with Jesus. Remember the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount? It's at a mountain, right? At the end of his life, right? With Matthew 28, what does he do? Takes him to a mountain. So anytime you're going to encounter the mountain, you have to expect, just like Moses, right? Moses has an encounter with the Lord on a mountain. Jesus is, is doing the same thing. Now, the question is, where's this mountain? It's kind of one of those when you go to Israel, you go to different tour guides. Oh, it's over there. It's over here for 500 shekels. I'll confirm for you it's here. And so that's the kind of mindset. So I'm going to give you four options. I just think this is the reason is, is because when you go to Israel, this is a hot topic. This is a, an ongoing conversation. Where is did the transfiguration take place? Rich and I already know we've been there. We've got it figured out. 
Just kidding. Anyway, a couple options, okay? Uh, just because we can do this, let's go a couple options. One of the options is Mount Tabor, okay? That, that's one of the options. Just so you know, you're gonna have four options, okay? That's about 1,900 feet elevation, right? That's kind of the mindset. Most people would say, no, all right? Then you have Mount, and I, I'm gonna say this wrong, Moran, not Moran, Mount Moran, okay? It's between Caesarea Philippi, okay? Normally I wouldn't get into details about locations, but this is one of those, it's ongoing. So between Philippi and, do you guys remember Jesus' headquarters? Remember that location? Capernaum, okay? Most would say though as well, eh, no, but it is a conversation. It could be, okay? If I cross it out and I've offended you, relax. I'm not dogmatic on any of these, okay? Then you also have Mount, Rich, what's the one mountain that we couldn't find? Arbel. Mount Arbel, okay? Uh, that's on the west side of Galilee. I was utterly convinced I could find this, right? I was utterly convinced. How'd, how'd that work out, Rich? Um, I think you, I think there was a guy who was doing some home remodeling. He went in and asked him how to get their directions, and you still, we still couldn't find we it. We still couldn't find it. So I don't know, we, just because we couldn't find it. Most, most would say, again, if you like these other views, I'm okay with that. But Mount Her, uh, Herman, Mount Herman, 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 Mount Herman, Herman? Mount Herman. So usually it's, the elevation is about 9,400 feet. It fits more accurately. And so when you think out, when you think of the transfiguration, I want you to think a little bit more about Herman. And who's he with? Kevin, how many people? Three. Three, okay, we know that and not 500. So these three are gonna be hanging out here and what they're gonna encounter is a transfiguration. Just as a quick reminder, how would we define transfiguration again? I think this is important to understand. Rich, what do you got? What's your definition? The definition of transfiguration is a complete change of form or appearance into a more beautiful or spiritual state. Okay, awesome. Go to verse two. Now you'll see the transition. It says he was transformed in front of them. Jesus literally, I, I don't know how else to describe this, something radically changed in front of him, okay? So here's what I wanna do. I'm gonna give you four points from our famous Warren Wearsby, right? Warren Wearsby has why the transfiguration, uh, the things that it points to. So what I want us to understand is, is that you're gonna see the glory, okay, of his person, okay? The glory of his person, Jesus as a person, okay? So he was transformed and look what happens. It says his face shone like the sun. Even his clothes became as white as the light. How many times when we study the gospels, whenever you encounter an angelic being or a being that has experienced the heavenly realm, whenever you encounter them, something, there's this brilliance, there's this radiance and it's like, yeah, that's, that's what I want. You know, this is a drastic statement, but I just think it's really cool because I have this much respect for Billy Graham. Uh, one of my mentors was the president of Taylor University at the time, Jay Kessler. And Jay Kessler used to interact with Billy Graham. And I was sitting down with Jay and I was asking him, hey, tell me about some of your experiences with Billy Graham. He said, the one thing that was always intriguing, and he said, I'm not making it exaggerating. He said, there was always a radiance and a glow about Billy. Like there was just something that it was like people were drawn to. And, and I'm, I'm not trying to make that comparison. I'm just saying when you've been in the presence of God, then it, there, there's something that people want and there's a, there's a dramatic change in your appearance. You don't walk around with this depression. You don't walk around with this woe is me. And so what Jesus is beginning to show very simply is that there's the glory of his, of his person. And in this, okay, as his clothes were white as light, watch what it says in verse three, okay? Suddenly, we've got more people in the game. Okay, so now you got Peter, James, and John. And then we're gonna add, you ready for this one, Kevin? This is gonna really get you excited with your numbers. We're gonna add two more. Oh, for a total of? Five. Five, you have Moses and Elijah appear to them and he is talking, Jesus is talking to Moses and Elijah. Why the significance, guys, that Moses and Elijah appears? What, what would be the significance of Peter, James, and John seeing two guys from the Old Testament? How would you tie this in? Well, one, Moses laid out the law and was taking the people to the promised land. And then Elijah was supposed to come before the Messiah and he would represent the prophets. Moses represents the law, Elijah represents the prophets. Remember, if you can, go to Matthew 5, 17. Jesus is showing the glory of his person. Now watch in Matthew 5, 17, part of, Matthew, uh, part of the transfiguration on Mount Hermon, it, it really is to emphasize Matthew 5, 17. Don't assume that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy, but to 
fulfill. So when you have the representation of the law and the prophets and hanging out with Jesus, all of the sudden it's like God saying, yes, this is ordained. I have approved this. I know it sounds simple, but I'm telling you, Christ didn't say, go away, Moses. He didn't say, go away, Elijah. He says, how can I fulfill everything that they've said? Man, what an incredible picture. And so you're absolutely right, Kevin. It's an incredible picture. Stanley Two Saints says this, the presence of the Old Testament saints with Christ in a glorified state is the greatest possible verification of the kingdom principles in the Old Testament. By having them show up, you are saying we have this, it's like this stamp of approval that we are in agreement that this is the next step. This is who we've been talking about. This is who we've been preparing. This is what I want us, each of us, to look for. Now in verse four, <laughs> I love Peter's lines. Peter says to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Yeah, you're in the presence of like the greatest of the greats. Like you're saying, oh yeah, I, I can't imagine a better place. Peter just always states the obvious. And so here's what he says. If you want, Lord, I will make three tabernacles here. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Why on earth, you guys, would he say this? Feast of the booths or tabernacle? Okay, that sounds good. What do you mean by that? Well, they were... It was remembering them coming out of Egypt, and so it was a celebration, and they would make little booths. So he's actually making booths for, in remembrance of this time. A remembrance of what God has done in the past, right? And so now, again, let's celebrate that God's got us to this point on a mountain. Kevin, you're like full on today. Taylor, you want anything to that? Good stuff. Yep, that's what I thought. <laughs> just wondering if you're going to add anything to this. And, and, and I just think, too, Peter wants to stay here, you guys. Think about this. A booth is that you want to just, I just want to be here. I want to be in the presence of Moses and Elijah. Because had Peter ever met them before? I mean, think about this. These are all the stories that he's heard about, and he's in the presence of the greats. I mean, this is Hebrews 11 right in front of his face. All right, so the glory of his person is confirmed. Christ is confirmed in this just by his transformation of his physical appearance, okay? All right, so in the second part, okay, in verse five, he's gonna reveal the glory of his kingdom, okay? So the glory of his person, okay? Because we see his physical humanity beginning to change, right? Into, you're gonna see a resurrected body, okay? That's what you're gonna see. It's gonna be what Christ looks like uh, when, when he comes back. This is what he's going to look like. Now we're going to talk about the glory of his kingdom, okay, in verse 5. So Peter's talking. Who knows what he's rambling on about, right? Hey, I think we need to stay here. I think we need to be present. Let's just stay in these booths. This is going to be incredible. And while he's uh, still speaking in verse 5, suddenly a bright cloud covered them. And a voice from the, from the, from the cloud said, now think about this. Whenever I think of a cloud, I actually never think of a bright cloud. I don't know why. I just think of a, of a dark cloud. I think of it just, it's a cloud, but this is like a vibrant cloud. And then a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son. I take delight in him. Peter, shut up. <laughs> it doesn't say that. It says, listen to him. But that's what's taking place. Is that not true? Peter is trying to like, hey, Jesus, this is what we want to do. And all of a sudden the Lord just intervenes and he says, this is my beloved son. I take delight in him. Listen to him. Man, this is awesome. Strangely enough, can you go to Matthew 3, 17? Where else have we heard this before? Where else have we seen this? Here we have the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus is showing the baton has really been passed. And in Matthew 3, 17, it says, And there came a voice from heaven, This is my beloved Son. I take delight in Him. What's the context of this, you guys? Do you remember? Jesus' baptism. Jesus' baptism. So Jesus' baptism, you hear the same language in Matthew 3, 17. Now here we are on, in Matthew 17. That's kind of easy to remember, right? You hear the same words. There's repetition in God confirming. Now, here's the cool part to me. Like, this is a messianic, there's a messianic psalm that points to this version. Can you go to Psalm 2, verse 7? So you're seeing the glory of Jesus' humanity revealed. You're seeing the glory of, of his kingdom revealed. Now watch, in Psalm 2, 7, this is the psalmist. It's a prophetic, messianic uh, psalm. I will declare the Lord's decree, he said to me. You are my son. Today I have become your father. Again, if you are Moses, if you're Elijah, if you're somebody in the Old Testament and you hear these words coming from a bright cloud, everything points, you guys, to the Messiah. 
Everything during the baptism, during Mount, uh, uh, transfiguration. And so you're hearing this language. Go to Isaiah 42, 1. I just want to keep reiterating part of Revive School's point and purpose is what? It's literally to say the Old Testament always pointed to Christ. So what you're seeing in the transfiguration, you're literally seeing a fulfillment of all of these prophecies that are pointing to Christ. And Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, who I, uh, Elijah is, is representing, he says, this is my servant. I strengthen him. This is my chosen one. I delight in him. I have put my spirit on him. He will bring justice to the nations. And so I cannot emphasize this meeting on the mountain is like the climax of the climax saying, I am the guy that you've been pointing to. This is me. And I'm going to establish a future kingdom. I'm establishing who I am and my future, my future kingdom. And it's just kind of like to me, like, I don't know. I, I, I can't even think of a, 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 the time. But when you've ever experienced a, a prophetic word, that somebody's given to you. I'm just gonna tell you, like there was a gentleman that gave me a prophetic word uh, in the Midwest. And he spoke over in my life at a church. There were 600 of us. And he called me out in the second or third row. And he said, I, this is what I see in your life. Well, a year later, those things that he said, part of it, I'm actually starting to experience. And there's this weird satisfaction that the Lord's hand is on you when you experience things that were shown to you earlier on. Christ is walking out fulfillment of all of these words from the law and the prophet. I mean, think about this, you guys. We're, we're not even going to go into the time of all of this, but think about all these offerings that we're talking about. Remember all the sacrifices and all the offerings and all the killings? And then think about the Day of Atonement, and how everything, all of that keeps pointing to the Messiah. And then think about the prophets and the prophets and all of their prophetic words, like we just said, they're pointing to the Messiah. And now they're all standing on the mountain. And in the middle of this, Peter's all excited and God says, stop, Peter. I just want to confirm to you, this is my chosen one. It's kind of like this slow down moment. And when the disciples, Peter, James and John and their 497 friends, <clears throat> just kidding, Kevin. When the three of them were there, when they heard the voice of the Lord from a cloud, a bright cloud, what was their response? It says that they fell face down and were terrified. I, I think to me, whenever you begin to realize that you are way over your head and you're in the presence of God, it's like, let's just fall face down. And I said this when I was in, in Wisconsin, just even just last week, I felt like the Lord just constantly was saying to me in your time of worship, when I show you a position and a posture that I want you to get in, I want you to do it. And I was like, I don't, I don't like that. You know, like when the Lord shows you something because you're in his presence. And the reason I don't like it, I can just tell you, is fear of man. That, that's it. Like one time <laughs> I was in a morning prayer time in a corporate setting and the Lord just showed me. And I'm telling you, I think it was like this test. And he wanted to show me. He showed me laying down on these chairs and he showed me how he wanted me to lay. Am I willing to listen to what he's saying? And when the disciples, when the disciples heard the voice of the Lord, they fell face down. They were Terrified. You go back to Matthew 17, verse 7, it says, Then Jesus came up, he touched them, and he said, Get up, don't be afraid. Relax, it's okay. What we just heard is from the Lord. And I, I really believe most of the time, and you know what, Taylor, how did Moses always hear from the Lord? It was this loud, audible voice, always on a mountain. That's what it felt like, right? Maybe that's how Moses and Elijah always heard. So maybe there was just something like, Oh, hey, that's how you hear from God too. And Peter, James, and John might not have been used to that communication. I know for me, when I had the, the burning bush experience, the Damascus Road experience, to hear an audible voice of the Lord is extremely odd. It was overwhelming. And like, I remember sitting down on my bottom and my head against a pole. And I remember I just wanted to keep falling forward. I just remember I wanted to keep falling forward. It's kind of like, uh, just that, it, it, it's what the Jews do in Israel, Rich, right? What do they do? They constantly are doing this. And so there's this something about the presence of God. It's, I mean, glory means weight. So when you sense the weight of God's glory, maybe they are falling down. He says, look, relax, don't be afraid. In verse eight, when they looked up and they, they saw no one except him, Jesus alone. I'd be like, dang, I missed it. <laughs> what happened? Moses and Elijah, gone. I'm sure there was a, that sound effect was there. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's just Jesus, Peter, James, and John. And then here's what you're going to see. And so he's establishing his kingdom, right? Isn't that what God's doing? He says, this is the guy that I've chosen. He's establishing his kingdom. But now watch what happens. Jesus begins to establish on the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember, as Wearsby unfolds this, it's the glory of his cross. 
And I like this because in verse 9 it says, as they were coming down from the mountain. Wow, what was that? Oh, whoa. Did we just see Moses? Yeah, did you just see Elijah? Did you just hear the voice? Yeah, oh yeah, man, I fell down. And they're like, what on the world? Why are we going through this? And then Jesus said, don't tell anybody about the vision. Don't tell anybody about what just happened with the law and the prophets. Don't tell anybody. Why? Because prophecy needs to take place until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. I trust you. You're my inner circle. I don't want you to release anything, but I wanted you to understand what you saw until you see the Son of Man. There's that reference again. The Son of Man is raised from the dead. Five times. Can you go to Matthew 8, 4, Kevin, please? Matthew 8, 4, you see this thread. Jesus saying five times he does this in the Gospel of Matthew. See that you don't tell anybody. See that you don't tell anybody. Kevin, if you go to Matthew 9.30, there's this thread of, shh, don't tell anybody yet. Matthew 9.30 says this. And their eyes uh, were open. Then Jesus warned them, be sure that no one finds out. Matthew 12, verse 16, if you'll go there again. Matthew 12, 16. Uh, he warned them not to make him known. And then last one, Matthew 16.20. I'm doing this for a reason. Matthew 16.20. Everything was about God's timing. And he gave the disciples orders to tell no one that he was the Messiah. What God is going to reveal is that the glory of his cross needs to take place. And it's in God's timing, not in man's timing. And then I love this. I love this in verse 10, the disciples. It's not that they push back, but they're curious. They don't always understand everything. So the disciples question them, why? Okay, okay, wait, hang on. Moses and Elijah showed up, right? We're realizing the glory of your person. We saw you, saw you differently. Wow. And then we saw that God, we heard that God's establishing your kingdom. And then we're talking about the glory of his cross. And then the disciples say, well, why then did the scribes say that Elijah must, must come first? Like, I'm not sure I understand this. In verse 11, it says, Elijah is coming and will restore everything, he replied. Why do they say this? Go to Malachi, if you would, Kevin. Malachi 4, 5, and 6. What were these people waiting for, right? We've talked about this. Look, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Verse 6, it says, And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. Now, I just want to tell you this. In Revive School, look, I know we haven't seen Elijah yet, but I will tell you there's nothing more rewarding when I hear fathers have a heart for their kids and the kids have a heart for their fathers. To me, it's an indicator of a, of a true move of God. It's an indicator of the Spirit of God moving. And so their expectation was Elijah was going to come. But then we talked about this, you guys, with, with John the Baptist. What happened? Do you remember this? They rejected him. They rejected John the Baptist and his words. And since they rejected John the Baptist, they technically rejected the prophecy of Elijah coming at that time. So John the Baptist did not fulfill Elijah because the Jews said no. Correct? So at that time, then, they're still waiting for an Elijah to come. And so Jesus says, Elijah is coming and will restore everything. That's in alignment with them saying they rejected him, John the Baptist earlier. Does that make sense? Because some people would say, is John the Baptist actually Elijah? Jesus says right here, he's coming to come to restore everything, which is to fulfill one of the prophetic words from the book of Malachi. So we use this verse, okay, to let you know that John the Baptist could have been Elijah, but because the Jews said no, Jesus said he's still coming. He's going to prepare the way for the Messiah. Everybody, does that make sense? It's kind of a lot back there. Rich, you're always good about letting me know if that doesn't make sense. I'm tracking. So I just think that's something that we really, really need to understand and emphasize. And I know because of time, we really could camp out a whole lot here. I mean, there's so many points under each one, person and the kingdom and the cross. But just trying to paint an overall picture of these disciples. Okay, let's go to the last one if we can, okay? In verse 12, and this is exactly what we just talked about, exactly to a T, we're going to talk about the glory of His submission. But as we do, watch as this unfolds. In verse 12, it says this, But I tell you, Elisha had already come, has already come, and they didn't recognize him. That's John the Baptist. On the contrary, they did whatever they pleased to him. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. In verse 13, then the disciples understood that he spoke to them about John the Baptist. All right, guys, I, I want to walk through this submission. Uh, Rich, when you hear sam submission, what do you think of? Uh, coming under one's authority. 
like giving up my 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 will and being obedient to a higher authority. So absolutely. So here's what I want to do with this whole thing: transfiguration. Okay, you look at transfiguration, right? All of these four points talk through the person, the kingdom, the cross, but you have to have the submission part in order for all of this to happen. Imagine if you have the person, the kingdom, and the cross, but you have no submission. It never actually happens. And so you cannot experience a future kingdom unless the submission process actually takes place. And so in Jesus, until he actually gives up his life. Now, here's the craziest thing about all this, you guys. James, he was the first disciple to die. James actually learned to submit in Acts 12, 1 through 2. What happens? He's dead. John, we know eventually he's cast to the island of Patmos, right? After possibly burning in, isn't it tar or boil? Or he's, he's being boiled and then they throw him off to an island. Like it's pretty drastic. And then Peter, what happens to him? He suffers and he dies. The inner three who hear the truth of why the transfiguration actually takes place. And so here's a simple, simple phrase. And I know everybody knows this. But it's kind of like in order to experience life, you have to experience death. And to me, this is exactly what the law and the prophets are talking about. And so in 2 Peter 1, 16 through 21, I want, to, I want to close this message out with Peter's words on how radically impacted he was because of Mount, uh, the, the transfiguration at Mount Hermon. He says this, for, for we do not follow cleverly contrived myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, it wasn't just some kind made up. It was truth. Instead, here's what I love. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw the transfiguration take place. And in verse 17, it says, For when, we real, when he received honor and glory from God the Father, a voice came to him from the majestic glory. And what did Peter hear? He reiterates this. This is my beloved son. I take delight in him. You know what this means? It means that like... Uh, people would give up their lives if they knew the truth. And Peter's saying, I heard God say this. And as we heard this voice, it says in verse 18, when it came from heaven, while we were with him on the holy mountain, in verse 19. So we have the prophetic word strongly confirmed. Do you see this? We heard the prophetic word confirmed. I saw it. I heard it. I experienced it. You will do well to pay attention to this. You will do well to pay attention to it as to a lamp shining in a dismal place until the dawn day, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Like in other words, guys, this is essential. And in verse 20 says, first of all, you should know this. No prophecy of scripture comes from one's own interpretation. In other words, what we're releasing is not coming from us. But what does it say in verse 21? Because no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. I believe the transfiguration radically changed Peter and it drove him even to the point where he's willing to submit his own life for the gospel. Why? Because he knows that death will always lead to life. Guys, there's a lot here with the transfiguration. My prayer is, is that the Lord would just begin to highlight a little bit from Matthew 17. All right, guys, look forward to the tomorrow as a team of us continue to dig into Matthew 18. Thanks. Thanks.